and welcome to Mind with Coin Fund. This is the inaugural episode, Jake, of our new podcast, and we are so excited to be here. I'm David Packman. I'm the head of venture investments and managing partner at Coin Fund, and I'm sitting here with my partner and Coin Fund's founder, Jake Bruckman. Hey, Jake. Hey, David. Welcome, and welcome to me as well. <laughs> I know you are an avid podcast consumer and most would probably agree the world doesn't need another VC podcast, but what are we going to do differently here, Jake? Why are we doing this? Look, David, I think we have stuff to bring to the table. I think what Coin Fund has been good on is turning insight into foresight. We're a thesis and trend driven firm. We've been in the crypto space specifically for over nine years now. I feel like we've been to early crypto broadly, then we were early to DeFi or NFTs. You know, more recently, decentralized AI. The way that we've generally affected being early is spending a lot of time, uh, you know, in hopes of understanding and researching technology and extrapolating those ideas into the future, but also uh, thinking about them in commercial ways. How can they create new opportunities? How can they integrate with the world? And ultimately, how can they create a lot of value? Um, so I think that's what we're going to try to do in this podcast, to catch a glimpse of that potentially contrarian or early intriguing idea that could become a market shaping very large opportunity later. And that's what we'll bring to the table. So in true contrarian non-consensus fashion, most podcasts convey things like the latest news, 90 minute deep dive on a founder's life story, interview with a topical person in crypto. We're not going to just do that. We find that there are a lot of narratives in crypto in, in most subsectors of tech that get buried in the noise or the consensus of the moment. People on, on Twitter or the media or conference circuits tend to coalesce around talking about a main theme that isn't the only thing to talk about. So when developing this podcast, we wanted to explore sort of a central question. What should more people be talking about right now that they aren't? Kind of like, what's the kernel of truth that keeps you up at night that you wish more people were paying attention to? Or the thing that's getting you excited about this that, that other people are missing? Um, one thing I would observe about investing in general is that it, unless you're willing to kind of be intellectually alone or, you know, form an independent set of thoughts that are it's not what the herd is all talking about, you're probably not going to make any money. Right. You, you have to have a differentiated set of thoughts. I do think that uh, CoinFund has done a good job and, and built a track record of doing that. So we'll try to shovel that into our podcast. Absolutely, David. And I just got back from ECC where um, I would, me and some other folks there were reflecting on this idea of how much you actually have to sit with people in person, how much of that knowledge uh, you know, that's close to the technologies, close to the ground, is um, not really published on Twitter or online. And it's really uh, contained within the relationships and conversations that happen there. Um, and a lot of the contrarian views that emerge, and my, one of my pet contrarian views has been around the centralized training of AI. It's really something that, you know, if you go out there and try to just sort of glean from information there. You, I don't think you you get a fully accurate picture. Um, I thought that was interesting. I think we can bring some of that to this podcast, some of that kind of insight. And just to say like a little bit about me, um, I'm a technologist, I'm an engineer. I'm an early stage investor now for, for about a decade. Um, I discovered Bitcoin very early in, the, in April of 2011 and have been intrigued by blockchains, you know, decentralized networks and decentralization in general since then. I used to work in financial and pure technology. I was on Wall Street and hedge funds and then at Amazon as a technical product manager and engineer and also a CTO of a fintech startup. I started CoinFund in 2015 after reading Vitalik's white paper because I just couldn't get the thought out of my head that digital assets made such sense for a digital world, it would be a new asset class. Since then, blockchains have proliferated. Some of that thesis has uh, worked out quite well. The blockchains are now in the process of being connected together and impacting, starting to impact institutions and enterprises and all kinds of business. 
And finally, in general, David, it really feels like this is a really important moment for crypto. Crypto has been fighting for regulatory normalization, you know, government um, dialogues and acceptance for close to a decade now. It really feels like we're on the brink of massive institutional adoption events, you know, in that sense. So we're here before, before that inflection point happens. I agree with you, Jake, that this moment feels salient. It feels like an important time in crypto and in tech, especially with sort of the intersection of, of AI and mainstream technology. So let's try to make this a promise to our listeners. We'll, we'll try to keep this tight, 30 to 40 minutes. We will use our network to bring forth brilliant builders and talk with them and surface ideas that are, that are differentiated, that are non-consensus, that are worth fighting for. And of course, we'll try to make it a no-hype zone if you're coming across this podcast, you probably know a thing or two about crypto. You may not be familiar with CoinFund. Uh, we are one of the oldest crypto native investing firms. As Jake said, we've been around since 2015. We champion the leaders of the new internet by investing in the future of technology that is sort of driven by a lot of these uh, ethos buried in crypto. We've invested in more than a hundred companies across six different investment strategies. If you'd like to learn more, you can find us on the web at coinfund.io. And maybe just to address one last aspect of our podcast, why well, call it mind? While everything we do at CoinFund, we strive to be thoughtful uh, and pragmatic. I love the simple reminder uh, to stay cerebral here with a reference to mind. Hopefully what you hear here will stay in your mind as inspiration to keep exploring. Mining is a cryptographic process the blockchains do, but in the physical world, mining is about digging through rocks and boulders to find gems. And I love that as a company, we've been quite good at that. Um, for us, this means, you know, getting to the important and big ideas and concepts that are underneath the surface of this industry. So let's make the podcast about that. That is what we're going to do. That's what Mind with Coin Fund is all about. Let's kick this off. Hey, everybody, Jake and I are so excited to welcome Ian Rogers, the Chief Experience Officer of Ledger, to our show as our inaugural guest. Ian leads the consumer-facing business of Ledger, which has pioneered the technology of hardware wallets to safely purchase and secure your crypto. I've known Ian for a long time, and let's see, he was, prior to this, the Chief Digital Officer at LVMH. He worked across a handful of amazing luxury brands that we all covet like Louis Vuitton, Dior, Sephora. Prior to this, he and I intersected for many years as he worked to bring digital music mainstream. And we are pioneers and warriors from the early digital music days. Among many things, he launched uh, Apple Music in 2015, the service that so many of us use. And he uh, helped build one of the best services for artists to sell creative works directly to fans called Topspin. He's been on the forefront of new tech for his entire career, and we are so excited to have him as our first guest. Hi, Ian. Hey, I am honored to be your first guest. You know, David, I think I remember the day that we met. I do I too. I think it was the QuickTime Music Festival, and I think it was 1995. What was that at um, Irving Plaza? And you were you were the webmaster for the Beasties. It was it was early early Beastie Boys days for me. I may have still I was either I think I had just left college, or I was even still in college and kind of like moonlighting. We have so many good stories. And um, I think what was so cool about our early days together was we were in sort of this primordial soup of the early internet. And it does feel like to me that even though we're, I don't know, 10 or 12 years into crypto, it still feels like there's kind of a primordial soup here of like, we're building infrastructure for a very interesting future, but it isn't all fully clear yet. Ian, you've had such a, um, an eclectic career spanning a long time and many different kinds of companies. I was just going to get right into it. How did you end up at Ledger and what are you doing there? So, yeah, I, thanks a lot. It's, um, I feel so lucky because I remember the day that we launched Apple Music. And for me, I was so proud. It literally felt like my life's work because I started doing digital music when it was part of academia. I mean, I started building a streaming music service for the dean of the Indiana University Music Library in 1992. And then 2015, Tim Cook is on stage and it says, we love music behind him. 
And I really just felt like, you know, it was literally my life's work. But I also had ringing in my head, Mark Geiger saying, until Apple gets into the game, the starting gun hasn't even gone off yet. So I had this vision of that being the starting gun. But I also, I remember I called my wife at the time that night and said, I think for me, it's the finish line. I just felt like, you know, it's an, now it's an oligopoly. Like I'd watched the music business go from five labels to three and from zero digital music to, you know, an increasing and like, you know, kind of all consuming percentage of digital music. And I didn't know what I wanted to do next, but I was ready to do something else. I realized that, you know, I, being a quote unquote music executive was never exactly what I had in mind. You know, I really enjoyed kind of the thrill of the chase and there was no chase left. It's not like I was going to, you know, come to you guys and go, Hey, will you fund me to start the next SoundCloud? You know, I mean that, that those days had passed, but I didn't know what it was. So I got a call from a recruiter who'd asked me if I had heard of LVMH and I said, no. And uh, they asked me if I'd heard of Ben, I don't know. And I said, no, but I'm like hitting Wikipedia at the same time. I listened to hip hop. So I'd heard of the brands, but I didn't realize there was one company who owned both Celine and Sephora that was unknown to me. And long story short, I came over here to France to be the chief digital officer of LVMH. For me at the time, it was a couple of things. You know, I feel like what I had become over those 20 years doing digital music was a student of how the internet changes culture. One of the first people I met here in Paris was Pascal Gauthier, who was originally the first seed investor in Ledger, and he was a board member when I met him. And so I got to become familiar with the company over five years. Another one of the first people that I met here in Paris was Tony Fidel. He and I just happened to move to Paris at the same, same time and Bradley Horowitz introduced us and we became really fast friends. We needed each other. If I'm, if I, I, I hope that, that, that he would agree with that statement, like as expats coming to Paris, kids, the same age, et cetera, you know, like we, um, passionate about music, you know, passionate about technology, obviously we, we really fell in, fell in tight. And then during COVID we were all friends. And I think that, you know, I had, I was already a, a crypto owner, but during COVID is really when I went all in and it went all in, you know, both with my investment strategy, um, but also with my opportunity costs and my time, I went to Pascal who had, you know, made a couple of overtures to me joining Ledger before, but I said, okay, man, now's the time I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I've kind of finished my tenure uh, at LVMH. Um, or at least with this particular role. So I either go do something else at LVMH or I go do something else. And we worked it out for Ledger. So here I am. Awesome. Th thanks, Ian. Well, maybe you can also, for anyone who might not know, can you talk a little bit about like, what is Ledger? Why does it exist? And, you know, where are you guys headed at Ledger? Like, what's your true yeah. north? With, with pleasure, because I, I never mind talking about Ledger, even in mixed company, because it's one of these companies that's just so interesting in a way that, that it's not boring. You know, it's always a bit of a, um, you know, you really have to think about what this company is and why it exists. It's why I enjoy it. And I, it's why I don't mind talking about it. The company is this year, 10 years old. It was started by a group of, of, you know, very brilliant people here in Paris who were passionate about crypto and had this realization that, you know, okay, yes, there will be um, digital value. Yes. Bitcoin is something extraordinary. One of the real innovations with crypto is self-custody. You know, if you have, you know, the great thing about Bitcoin, what's extraordinary about Bitcoin is permissionless money, right? But to really have permissionless money, you need self-custody. If it's not self-custody, then it's not permissionless, right? But okay, well, if permissionless money, then digital ownership, but if digital ownership, then, oh my God, how does the security work, right? Because all of the devices that we are, you know, that we rely on today, our computers and our cell phones, they were, they were built for performance, not for security. And they, they really do an extraordinary, you know, amount of things, right? But one of the things they don't do particularly well is security. When we talk about software eating the world, what we mean is we've built this very general purpose device. Now everyone go write applications, you know, for that, for that general purpose device. Well, when it comes to security and security of real value, you don't want a general purpose device. It's like having a general purpose building to store gold bars. You know, hey, I've got an idea. Let's go store all of our gold bars in the middle of the shopping mall. Mm, no, let's not. Let's build a building that was designed just to protect gold bars. Now, there was an incredible technology that was developed tens of years ago here in France called smart card technology. And you probably have multiple of them in your pocket right now. The smart card is the secure chip that's in your credit card. It's in your passport. 
but obviously the secure chip that's in your credit card protects the secrets of the bank and the one that's in your passport protects the secrets of the government. And what that original ledger team had is this truly genius idea to use that same technology and very hardened security to protect the secrets of the user, the secrets of the individual, the, the secrets of the sovereign individual. And there is kind of a big idea that relates to freedom in this, right? We talk about permissionless money and decentralization, but you know, I could argue that your passport doesn't need to be decentralized. It's issued by a central authority who can also revoke it. You know, my gym membership doesn't need to be decentralized. And if I act like an asshole, they can take it away from me. But when it comes to things like property and speech, right, those do need to be decentralized to have freedom. And that's really what, what is extraordinary about that original ledger idea. So what you have is, and the magic trick with ledger is that the screen, and this is true, whether it's a ledger nano or a ledger stacks, the screen is powered by that secure chip. It's powered by a chip that wasn't intended for performance. It was intended for security. So you really need three things to be secure. One, your private key must be generated in a secure chip. So you have to have a secure chip that generates and protects your private key. You have to have a, an operating system running on that chip that does the cryptographic operations and they happen inside that chip. And then you need to have a secure display where you can, you, the user can approve any transaction, right? And Ledger is actually astonishingly, and I'm truly astonished by this because we've had some very smart players, you know, come into the market over the past years and Ledger is still the only device that does all of those three things, you know, so competitive devices might use secure memory, but they use a general purpose MCU, like, uh, the same thing that's in your remote control for your television to generate the seed and to do the cryptographic operations, which is still more secure than being in a software wallet, but you know, not as secure as Ledger. Um, and they, the screen is either non-existent or you know, powered by that MCU, which is, which is also not as secure. So this company has taken really an uncompromising you know, view of security and then tried to build around that. You know, the initial use case was I take my Bitcoin, I move it to my ledger, I put it in the closet, I wait two years, and then I come back and I check the value. Whereas today we're building many more applications on top and, you know, many of us are, you know, using our ledger in our daily lives. For example, we've just launched an application called Security Key, which does 2FA and pass keys, right? So forget about crypto. It's simply a better way to do what you do with Google Authenticator, a better user experience because I can just tap it on my phone with NFC. I don't know if you read, um, this is how they tell me the world ends. You know, highly recommend it if, if, you, if you haven't. No, Nicole Pearl Roth, New York Times writer, very readable book. Yeah, great, great. Uh, she's so embedded with uh, the real security community. Yeah, I mean, even if you're not a you know security nerd like us, it properly contextualizes that you could say, this year will be the worst year ever for cybercrime, like every year for the rest of your life, and you don't even need to fact check. You will be correct. I'm, I'm sure you'll be correct. And that's, that's the world that we live in. So, you know, so we, we have, we'll have more digital assets in the world tomorrow than we had yesterday. It'll be a heterogeneous environment where we will use trusted custodians for some things, but we'll have self-custody for others. You know, in that case, security is absolutely paramount, both on the custodial side, as well as on the retail side. So we have Ledger Enterprise for that custodial side, for the security for the custodians. And then we have Ledger Consumer Products um, for, for the self-custody side. Well, Ian, maybe, maybe that's like a topic to just jump into a little bit more here. I mean, you, so, so first of all, you mentioned that public key infrastructure is going to, you know, become more widely used in the future. I think Ledger is trying to affect some of that story. You know, I, I guess people have a common pushback on self-custody and crypto. So, so you mentioned like, you know, this is an important primitive sort of freedom and democracy. Totally agree with you, but, but people have a legitimate pushback, which is to say, Hey, like, isn't it dangerous to hold a million dollars on a ledger, doesn't that create kind of a personal security risk? Like how does ledger and how do you, you know, think about criticisms like that? Like how, how do you address that? I think there's a, there's a variety of criticisms to address there because one is, is it dangerous from an operational security perspective? And the answer is no. Um, you know, you, you, you have, uh, you know, kind of um, kidnapping and, um, you know, torture risks, but rich people have those same risks, you know, all, all, all the time. Um, and the reality is, is that the, you know, ledger is a magic safe, right? So on the operational security side, you know, there are many ways to mitigate those risks, but 
you know, the reality is, is that your sports car or your luxury watch is of value to a thief. If you are dead, your ledger is not right. Um, you put a pin code wrong into a ledger three times and it evaporates. It's a magic safe where you can like, you know, you can load it, you can throw it into the fire. You can cross a border with your 24 words and then just recreate the device. So that's, that's one, I think, you know, we can talk more about the kind of operational security side. Um, but then there's the, really the, the recovery side. I mean, isn't it just, you know, you have other things to mitigate, like, well, what if I lose my recovery phrase? What if I lose my recovery phrase and, you know, my memory and I forget my 24 words? What if something happens to me? How do I handle inheritance? You know, so these are all, I think, also very practical problems that I think if we fast forward 10 years, 12 years on the maturity side, we'll have kind of many options and solutions for those. So what I would say is I'm, my belief is we'll just have a very heterogeneous world with a lot of options. You know, we already have people who buy multiple ledgers so that they can, you know, do account segregation, right? One's for a college fund. Uh, one is my mint wallet. One is my, my vault for my NFTs. One is my, um, you know, my kind of deep cold storage that I put some Bitcoin on and I'm putting in a safe and I'm not going to even, you know, have it in my physical possession for the next five years, you know, so you can do any of the above. Um, also we have a product called ledger recover, which is all about private key backup and recovery and doing it in a way that's tied to your identity. So again, you know, not for everyone, but you know, I think it is for the vast majority of people who have less than $50,000 in value in crypto. They don't necessarily trust themselves with their backup of their recovery phrase. Um, it is better OPSEC to not have that recovery phrase in your house where someone who walks into your, your apartment tomorrow might, might have access to it. Um, you know, et cetera. But also I think just like you have a, a checking account, a savings account, a brokerage account, you've got, you know, mul you've got both custody and self custody in your wallet, whether it's cash and Metro tickets and credit cards or, and, and identification, um, or the various keys on your key ring, you'll have a mixture, right? I mean, I have, you know, I have some Bitcoin on a ledger. Uh, I have some crypto, uh, at Kraken, and I own some of uh, the BlackRock ETF because I had a 401k left in the US and I pushed my assets into it, right? There's a real reason um, for that future to be heterogeneous. And I think what's important is that consumers have choice. You, you paint a picture, Ian, that I think many people in crypto would appreciate and agree with, which is that we'll have more digital assets. And there are two main ways of storing those today from a security perspective, a centralized custodian and a decentralized or you know, non, non-custodial, um, or so self-sovereign way. Um, and we've been arguing about these needs, not arguing, but I think most people appreciate that, like, that is a future that's, that's present and, and highly likely to continue. Um, but there's a lot of complexity on the, you know, non-centralized custodian side of things. And I feel like Ledger is a company that's been really working to reduce that complexity, right. To make this experience of, of, uh, of having non-custodial assets easier. But a lot of us have talked about this and you guys are making good progress, but what is something that people in the crypto world are not talking about or under appreciating? What is the real elephant in the room here about this debate? I think I, I'm going to answer by tying two things, the two things you said together. I, I think, you know, what this reminds me of, and I'm laughing, uh, you know, in my head as we're, as we're talking about it, David, cause you and I were like, so deep into this complex product that Rob Lord and I made in the early 2000s that was a little agent that sat on your computer and read your MP3 collection and then would allow you to listen to your MP3 collection when you were in a place other than your home. And that is so absurd today when I can just go, hey Siri, play some Slayer, right? And it's just magically comes out of my phone, right? That was just unimaginable at the time. So I want to I want to point that out because you know, the, we knew that future was coming in 1999, right? And again, you know, we got Spotify in the late 2000s and Apple Music in 2015 is like, which you could, I think you could point to kind of the start and then the mainstreaming of that technology. And I think the one thing that crypto people need to, uh, to take as a lesson from that is all of these ideas do come true, but you do have to build more of the fundamentals and get there over time, right? I mean, I think that, you know, it wasn't the case that you just said like, Hey, play this, you know, Hey Siri, play some Slayer. Like there was a lot of fundamentals that had to be built to get to that point. Right. In the end, it's so simple, but all of the, you know, the steps that had to go through on both the league, you know, I mean, even just like paying artists and doing the record label deals and, you know, I mean, 
2014, I was still arguing with record labels about basic things, right? And their answer was, in every case, fuck you, pay me, right? You know, so we're, we're, th these fights are very real and they go on a very long time. So I just think you have to remember that I think this arc is always 15 years, not five months, which is what you think it is in, in, in the beginning. And, that, and I also think to come back to my earlier point, you do underestimate it in the short term or overestimate it in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. And I think to answer your question, I think the thing that people are really underappreciating is how different the average person's experience of the web will be when the basis of their interaction is digital ownership instead of digital slavery. And I don't take that lightly. I, I challenge someone, do what I did, I can't remember, a few months ago now, move from an iPhone to an Android phone, right? and tell me that the words digital slavery are, are too harsh, right? Like the amount of pain you have to go through to not be, to be able to no longer communicate with your children via FaceTime and iMessage is, is immense. And it really, you know, shines a light on, you know, how reliant we are on what's behind the login. You know, listen to Joanna Stern's great reporting from last year in the Wall Street Journal. She did podcast and in print on people getting their iCloud accounts stolen and having them never come back, right? And now tell me that you don't think we give too much over. We've spent way too much time on the speculation aspect of this market and not enough time on how does this make the actual web better for actual customers. And to me, that makes perfect sense. Think about how much time us nerds spent talking about peer-to-peer and BitTorrent and Kazaa and LimeWire and BearShare and all of these things which had zero relevance to the average music consumer back in the early 2000s it was the only thing we talked about. And the average consumer didn't give a shit, right? And that is a lot of what's happening in crypto now. You want, well, what, should we talk about you know, meme coins or sports betting? Like, okay, that's, that's not where the action is or where the, the mainstream interest is. Now, the mainstream interest is in how is my user experience better how am I less at risk to be hacked and have my identity stolen? You know, and how is it that, you know, when I'm tapping my card at the local bodega, that I'm not using rails, which were, you know, designed for credit and not micropayments, you know, it's things like that, that are quite practical. So I, I think these are the things we don't spend enough time talking about. Well, so Ian, so this is a longstanding question in crypto, right? Like a lot of the stuff that we have been doing in crypto has been very infrastructure focused. It's been very like supply side. You know, I would even argue that Ledger, right, is the infrastructure component of the of the crypto stack. And the key question is like when the demand side comes, when we're building apps for the consumer businesses, you know, what are the really important areas that are generating that demand? And what you just said, I think almost suggests that you think that that is maybe like a security component of how people interact with products, but maybe can you expand like what, what do you, where do you think demand comes from, you know, and how is ledger and security part of that story? So I had such a great question. And I, I, this is where we like lean on our past, right. On our past experiences. But I do think the analogies are, are, are apt. Um, let's, let's just look at it through the eyes of ledger, right? For me. Ledger is like Cisco, to your point about infrastructure, I agree with. Um, it's like Cisco kind of transforming into an iPod in a way, and I'll tell you what I mean. It's like Cisco in that Cisco didn't really care who won, Microsoft or Netscape, right? They only cared there will be more internet tomorrow than there was yesterday. For me, Ledger is that same company. We are believers in the Bitcoin narrative. We are also believers in, in the Ethereum narrative of a world computer. We are very happy that you have cheap block space in this bull market that is coming on us right now that we didn't have in the previous bull market. So, you know, we're, we're believers in many of the narratives, but at a very, you know, like, you know, base level, digital ownership is all that's required for Ledger to be successful. We believe that digital ownership is a very powerful technology and that it will only proliferate that self-custody will be a part of that pl proliferation because you don't have permissionless money without self-custody. Um, and that if self-custody, then security is paramount and, and you go there. So our premise is simply, you know, building better user experience without compromising on security or self-custody. But I also think the iPhone was such a tipping point. Like it's impossible to overstate. And I, I, I can only laugh at all of us that spent 20 years <laughs> 
um, or maybe at least 15 years building web applications. I mean, think about it. Like I started building web applications. I built the second ever music related website. Like what could my motivation have possibly been? I always think, you know, David of Peter Gocher saying, if I had done the market research for Pro Tools, I absolutely wouldn't have made the product, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because like, what am I going to sell it to the 3000 recording studios in the US? Like, no, what it has to happen is you have to have this complete change. And so we were building web apps and we believed deeply in web apps. I remember, you know, Rob Lord and I running around in the early 2000s saying web browsers are perfect containers um, you know, for web applications, which was kind of a new word. They weren't websites, they were web applications, right? Um, you know, think about dApps now would be the, would be the analog, right? And, and so we, you know, at the same time, it was like when the iPhone came, I remember a colleague at Yahoo who wasn't in the music uh, business saying, yeah, I listen to Pandora in the car every day driving to work. And it was just like, there, there were, honestly was like, I felt like, the previous 20 years of my life had been kind of wasted. <laughs> you know, like, like what have I been doing? Like, why was I wasting my time trying to get people to listen to music on a windows PC? Wow. You know, because it's such a small market compared to the bigger use case. So I would argue that we kind of need that, like big, those big tipping point moments. We are, yes, we are building a lot of infrastructure, but I would argue that, you know, ledger stacks is a lot like an ipod right it's like you know it's the thing you could walk into best buy and buy and buy your first bitcoin and kind of you know use it for, use it instead of google authenticator or yubikey you know it has these like very mainstream um applications um you know at the same time it's not the iphone right it's the precursor um to that you know to that truly you know digital asset and not just digital asset but really private key enabled device that will come in the future that unlocks everything I do. And I also think that AI plays into this in a very big way because, you know, and, and look, Sam Altman, you know, I don't think people spend enough time realizing that Sam Altman got this joke years ago. You know, Sam Altman has a tweet from 2021, which is like, look, AI delivers digital abundance, blockchains deliver digital scarcity. Both are necessary, right? We already live in a world where we are, Believing AI, I use ChatGPT every day instead of Google, right? At this point in my life. And I am believing what it tells me, knowing that it's AI where part of the input was created by AI, right? So, you know, provenance and proof matter a lot in the future. Is this really me, right? How will you know? Um, you know, and, and ultimately that, that, that proof will be very important. So I think to me, there's a bigger thing here, right? I, when I say to my sunglasses, Hey, Meta, is it going to rain today? Right. I'm walking into a world with a user experience, which is very different from my phone. It does actually look more like humane or more like the rabbit R1, but that world from a basis of digital ownership is far more powerful. So I think when we get that combination, that will be that iPhone like tipping point. Right. Let's assume that those moments are coming that like we'll stipulate that we have more consumer web consumer applications dApps coming whether there's a cataclytic moment you know with an iphone like device or you know multiple or an uber like moment where just an app that everyone wants to use don't know but you you, you mentioned sort of go to market and um let's assume that that future is coming and 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 as when you're when you're entering a market you tend to have to ask yourself a few questions one is Am I replacing something that consumers already do with a better version uh, that they'll, they'll appreciate and switch to, or do I need to sort of teach them and instill some new behavior and, in order for them to love or use my product? And boy, security is just one of these questions where it's still in my mind remains unclear. Do we need, do we need consumers to shift their mindset and learn to adopt a new regime of digital hygiene? Or are we going to build products that totally abstract that away, right? Uh, whose responsibility is it to maintain security when you're doing self custody? I figure that's a good question for you. It's a great question, and and again, I you know it, it comes back to you know what's the vision of the future and how do we get there, right? You know, it's impossible to inhabit a future that we can't imagine, and so I think it's you know for me there's two parts to my answer, and I'm thinking I'm going to answer the question very practically, thinking about you know, how do we build the business of Ledger, right? Because for me, um, I always want to build something that I can sell today 
with that greater vision in mind, right? I don't want to be Magic Leap or Amiga, right? I I want I you know I want to be Apple, right? Or um, you know, or, or even what you know what I'm proud of in my career is that you know Winamp was very different from Yahoo Music, was very different for out from Apple Music, and they were all relevant for their moment, right? And that's I think what you, you're because you're building along a curve. You know, we have a vision for where for where we're going, but you know, I'm not going to trying to build for 15 years from now. I'm trying to build for today. So for Ledger, we actually have, you know, the nice thing about Ledger is we have a great built-in market because we've only sold 7 million ledgers and there are more than 500 million people in crypto, right? So if I can, if the only thing I do is close that gap between the 500 million people in crypto and the, you know, 7 million ledgers that are sold, I have a very nice business, right? So I assume that, you know, that curve will grow and hopefully I can either, you know, maintain or grow market share because I've sold relatively few devices, yet we have more than 20% of the total crypto market cap protected by Ledger. Because there is this natural progression where you come in a little bit of money on an exchange or a Robinhood or something like that, you get more interested, more educated, um, more concerned about, about security, more kind of invested in self-custody, and you come to Ledger. So if I can keep pace from a user experience perspective, then people will naturally gravitate to me because it is fundamentally better to store your ETH and stake it with Ledger than it is well, with an exchange. And even an ex you know a good exchange will say those same words. Um, you know, exchanges want trading volume, not custody risk. You know, our interests are actually aligned, right? So I would argue with exchanges, and we we're very friendly with exchanges, and they're great partners of ours because we have a very symbiotic relationship. You know, we're not a regulated custodian, and we don't do trading. So whether it's on our enterprise business or our retail business, they're great, you know, they're great partners for us, but also, you know, they are the first taste, the first bite at the apple. And that's, and that's a great thing. And that's a, and that's a great progression. I think when you start to look then at future technologies and you're talking about user experience, I think one, we need to continue to make that user experience great. But also when I think of a heterogeneous um, world in the future, I think of things like account abstracted wallets, which are absolutely the future. And they're going to deliver great user experiences. And we want to work with the people that are building those user experiences to push hard on those. At the same time, you know, if those account abstracted wallets are on a form with poor, our phone with poor security, then, you know, you want a rule set around those, you know, and that rule set is going to be set by secure hardware, right? So you're going to use your secure hardware for big transactions, for rule setting, et cetera. And then you might just tap your phone to spend. Absolutely. So I think, I, I think that these, you know, there's, there's lots of us from, you know, exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken to software developers and people making um, account abstracted wallets and, you know, L2s and, you know, everything chains, et cetera. And then there's what we do and what we bring to the table. And actually it's all of those things coming together, you know, which you'll really feel as a user. And I think the average user will feel 10 to 12 years from now. And we'll see how that all shakes out. Like, of course, there will be winners, losers, consolidation. Um, of course, that's, uh, you know, that's the game. Um, but I think that that's where we'll, where we'll end up. Thanks, Ian. Maybe we can jump into a um, little bit of a technical aspect of, of wallets. There's something called blind signing and there's something called clear signing. Clear signing is an important aspect of wallet technology. Maybe can you explain to the audience the difference between the two and how do consumers benefit from clear signing? Sure. So I think, you know, what I'm hoping is, is that people have a, people end up with a general understanding of um, how things work so that they can, you know, they can apply good practices when they're thinking about security. And I don't mean that everyone needs to become a security expert or a cryptographer, but I think it's kind of amazing that my mom, who's a year away from 80, has a pretty decent idea of how the web works, right? If she, if the server's not found, she you know, knows what that means. Whereas, you know, 25 years ago, that would have been like, a, you know, how, how could I even explain this to her? Right. But this is just, this is what happens over time. I think there is a bit of a challenge for people though, because, you know, people think that their value is inside of their ledger. Right. And, you know, it does require a bit of understanding, like, no, your value is on the blockchain. And what you have is the ability to say that value that's out there on the blockchain, you know, belongs to me. And it's important for people to understand then that there is security at rest, right? But it's the, I'm making a transaction. You know, how do I know 
that that transaction is what I think it is that you need to worry about. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, and, and as we mentioned earlier, things you're doing with your crypto are getting more and more sophisticated. It used to be, I bought some Bitcoin. I have the Bitcoin. I can send the Bitcoin, right? That was the sort of like the, you know, the, but now you've got incredibly complex things, even on Bitcoin, whether it's ordinals or runes or coming Bitcoin L2s, but in the world of Ethereum, which, we, you know, in DeFi and NFTs, which we've been playing with for the last couple of years, if you're doing things regularly in that world, then you're constantly signing transactions, which are smart contracts. And those, and those, and, and like exactly what's happening in those contracts is, you know, impossible to see unless you really, really review, you're an engineer and you review the contract. And so what you're doing is you're looking at the website, the website's telling you, here's the transaction. You go to your wallet, the wallet says, here's the transaction. And then you go YOLO and you just hope that there's nothing in the middle because there could be many things. Could be, you know, your browser's compromised, your OS is compromised. There is actually something happening under the hood in the contract, which is not, you know, you went, you think you're on the website, but you're not, you're on the wrong website. Um, you know, there are many things that can happen in that chain and there are, you know, lots of good solutions now, which are about transaction simulation and that removes one whole, that's kind of the low hanging fruit, I would say, because that's like the easy way to get scammed is phishing site. I think I'm doing one thing. The smart contract on the end, other is actually doing another, you know, your wallet says to you, Hey, you're going to lose one board ape when you do this transaction. Is that really what you want to do? And you're like, what? No. And you know, Rabi is the best wallet at doing all this stuff where, Hey, this is a, a, an address you've never sent to before. This contract hasn't been interacted with very many times. Here's my simulation of what that transaction does. Those are all necessary, but that doesn't solve the problem. You know, that gets rid of the easy scams, but the sophisticated scams remain. You have a compromised wallet, you have um, or, yeah, a compromised browser, a compromised OS. Um, and by the way, you can buy, you know, again, read, this is how they tell me the world ends. There's a marketplace for zero day hacks. If somebody wants to get into your phone, they can. Like, if you're targeted, they can get there, right? Um, and, you know, or it could just be that you have downloaded a rogue application, right? And it's, you think it's the application that you were looking for, but it's not. And it's doing something. And the only way you're going to see that is to sign, see what you sign on a secure screen. And so we have now, um, you know, we had a supply chain hack, a software supply chain hack in December of last year. And we're sitting around in the postmortem. And the interesting thing for me is this gap between what my security team sees and the way they behave and the way average consumers behave. And I feel like I'm sitting in the middle of it because I'm part of the NFT community and I'm watching people blind sign and YOLO all day, every day. And then I tell my security team, like, this is bananas. And they're like, yeah, those people are stupid. We'd never do that. Right. It, and it's just, I just see this massive gap. Like these guys don't even necessarily want to fix it because they're like, it's idiotic. Don't do that. That's stupid. You know, it's, it's like unsafe sex. Like, what are you doing? Like, it's a matter of time before you catch the germ. Right. And, you know, people over here are like, well, you know, this is, all my friends are doing it. This is what we do in crypto. YOLO. Right. And so I see that gap so clearly. So we were sitting around in the postmortem after the software supply chain hack. And our CTO shakes his head and he's just like, we just can't let people do it anymore. And when he said it, it's out of frustration. He wasn't even serious. Like he knows it's the right thing, but it's like, we don't want to tell you not to be stupid with your money. Like that's not our job, but we, we, you know, I, we just latched onto it. I said, that's the right answer. Like we, we have to figure this out, you know, not that we're going to tell people, but we need people to, to, to like, but we have to provide them an alternative. So we've spent the year doing this. I'd also argue we've done this in a much better way from a communications perspective than we did with Ledger Recover. With Ledger Recover, it's a great product and it's useful to very many people. But what we should have done was publish the white paper six months earlier, not the week after we launched, right? Because then we would have given people a lot of comfort around the implementation itself, right? So what we've done with this clear signing initiative is you know, we first met up with other partners, including other hardware wallets, all the major software wallets, you know, a ton of the top, top dApps. And we said, we've got to fix this. And when they said, you know, we, we know we got to fix this. We agree. Or like, but everyone's just kind of like, what an immense amount of work. Right. So we said, all right, we're going to propose something. 
we propose something, we do a request for comment, we go, we present it at ETH Denver, we present it in public at ETCC. We've, you know, we've done this like long march of, we think this is a huge problem. We've pulled together a consortium to fix it. Here's our proposal. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Let's have a robust discussion around what do we like? What do we don't like? What do we not like about this? And we will get there. I think this bull market, you know, where we have all of this great cheap block space and, you know, really completely different regulatory environment in many ways, et cetera, et cetera. Um, additionally, we're going to have the ability to clear sign and the ability to clear sign on a, you know, a three inch touch screen instead of, you know, a little monochrome display where you click okay with your thumbs, you know, it, so it's, it's like, it might not feel like much, but it is a lot of work and a lot of progress and it all adds up. I think to that, you know, that, that bigger future that we're driving toward down the road. Awesome. Ian, as we wrap things up, uh, maybe one observation I'll make is one of the things I love about crypto is I think there's a higher, uh, population of missionary driven builders in the space. There are plenty of mercenaries too, you know, people who hack smart contracts and extract money, but it does feel like a purpose driven industry for many of us. And clearly ledger is one of those companies you guys are, are clearly on a mission you you have clarity and, and sense of purpose where do you guys pull your inspiration from like what what's driving you i think that that the founders of ledger um put forward a very clear vision um and what's great i mean a, you know a company that's 10 years old in in, in crypto and is effectively saying the same thing it was day one I think is quite rare, but our mission is very simple, which is to bring more ease of use without ever compromising on security and self custody. Um, I think we're, we're purpose driven because, um, we really believe in a world of digital ownership. We think that digital ownership can and will be transformational, you know, and in the way that, you know, we always say that the hardest place to get people to understand Bitcoin is United States and the easiest place, um, you know, is Argentina. But it's, it is on that level, you know, it is freedom technology. There is something quite big to protecting the secrets of users, of individuals, and not only the secrets of banks and governments. We live in a world where, you know, um, untold money is spent protecting the secrets of banks, governments, big tech companies, et cetera. We're walking into a world where artificial intelligence, um, you know, has many implications in, including, um, on privacy and, uh, you know, and, and on authenticity on proof of humanity say, right. And so an individual with a private key who can prove they are who they are and that they own what they own is a freer and more sovereign individual than one who must log in to their bank, um, who must you know, who, who must prove they are who they are to the AI. And that might seem dystopian, but you know, you can experience it in many a chat bot on, you know, many a retailer site, um, you know, al already today. Right. Um, and, you know, but, but I think, uh, you know, an individual who has a pri a private key they can use as, you know, proof of humanity, proof of identity and proof of ownership is a freer and more sovereign individual than one without. And that is, that is fundamentally what drives us. But thankfully there are a lot of very interesting consumer, you know, consumer problems to solve along the way. I love digital art, you know, like that's, that's not an existential, um, issue. It's a fun one, right. But it's still, it's still fun and useful and, you know, has just as much a place in the world as a Basquiat painting. Where can people follow you to learn more? Keep in touch with you, Ian. I A N C R on Twitter. Um, and you can check out my, uh, the collect, the NFT collection of my wife and I at gallery.so slash high gallery, H I gallery. Thank you so much, Ian. Wonderful to hear the story. Can't wait to get my hand on a few of these stacks and congrats for staying so focused on bringing this product to market. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly, truly an honor. Thank you so much for joining us, Ian. That was Ledger's Chief Experience Officer, Ian Rogers. For those of you who tuned in, thank you so much for listening to the first episode of Mind. If you feel passionately that we got it right or if we got it wrong today, let's keep the conversation going. 
leave us a review. Let us know what you thought. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, my handle is at jbruk, J-B-R-U-K-H. And David's handle is at Pacman, P-A-K-M-A-N. Make sure you subscribe where you get your podcast. And we'll be back soon to dig deep on ideas that are worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you.